Hello, it's Jonathan Wellam of Rocklink Investment Partners, and it's February the 8th, 2016. Now, this is the first video that uh, we're shooting for this year, and it's already, in the first five to six weeks, been one interesting year and tremendous volatility. And so uh, I just wanted to point out that we've actually been hanging in very well. Uh, I don't think we've given up uh, much to the markets at this point because of our unique positioning in cash and some of the areas uh, that have done well, like precious metals so far this year. So we're doing well relative to the market, and I just want to make a few comments in terms of what has been going on in the market and what we can expect going forward. So the first slide that I want to put up is this slide that outlines the U.S. dollar relative to the Canadian dollar over the last 20 years. So it puts a little bit of perspective on the currency moves here for between the Canadian and U.S. dollar. And as you can see, there are wild, wild swings. There's no question, though, that over the last year, the swing was quite profound. And we see that uh, from 2014 through 2015, the U.S. dollar went straight up relative to the Canadian currency and also relative to most currencies around the world. And so, uh, as we've talked about before, a lot of that was just because of weak energy prices in Canada and Canada's tremendous dependence on the energy sector. What are we doing? We continue to diversify, continue to buy global businesses. Uh, we don't invest around predicting where the currency is going to go. Most importantly is the quality of the business that we're investing in, the sector, and the rationale for the long-term uh, opportunity for that company to create uh, shareholder value. So that's what we're doing. Now, then another point I just wanted to draw your attention to is that we have seen, as probably almost all of you know, very weak markets around the world. And that's, in our view, because the debt bubble, which we've talked about at length to you, um, we believe is starting to be popped. And there's a lot of pressure. And this is scaring the markets and it's causing a downward draft in equity prices. This is precipitated, of course, by very weak economic growth all around the world. And so if you've got too much debt and you're not growing your economies, then this is going to create tremendous stress and problems and write-offs and uh, even bankruptcies uh, throughout uh, portions of the economy. And so we need to be very, very vigilant and careful about the areas that we are investing. Now I want to highlight uh, for the remainder of this video this whole issue of negative interest rates. And we're very concerned about this. And so before I get into the real concerning stuff, I thought I'd put up a little bit of a, a comic relief. And, uh, and you can look at this, uh, this comic here, and it just emphasizes that things are really reversed. Instead of going to the bank and stealing from the bank, the bank, under the conditions of negative interest rates, actually steals from you uh, when you put your money in your savings account uh, in a negative interest rate environment, you're going to get less back. And so uh, this is not really a funny matter, but uh, I might have a little bit of humor before I give you some, some key points that I think would be helpful to you in terms of understanding this issue. So the next slide that we have um, up uh, in, front of, uh, in front of you on the screen is central banks with negative interest rates. So the trend now, because we've got so much debt all around the world, the world is just awash in debt, we're now starting to see central banks in more and more countries lower their lending rates to below zero. And so this graph tells you and shows you the various countries that uh, where we have central banks that have lowered interest rates to below zero. You have the Bank of Japan, you've got the Swiss Bank, the European Central Bank, the Den Den uh, Bank of Denmark, also um, some other smaller European uh, countries. And so this is a trend that uh, is very concerning. On the next slide that uh, is up on the screen, it's called Taking the Plunge. And what this shows you is that currently we have approximately 25% of the total world's GDP in countries where the central banks are running negative interest rates. And so this is becoming a bigger and larger phenomena and uh, we are concerned that it could easily spread into Canada and into more countries around the world as they attempt to deal with the debt bubble. 
Now the next slide, um, it just, uh, which is titled Europe's Negative Yielding Debt, this just shows again the, the level of debt, the quantum of debt um, by, within various countries that's trading at negative yields in terms of the sovereign debt or the government debt of these nations. And you can see that Germany, which is in the uh, blue, and uh, France, which is in the red, are large, large components of this uh, negative trading debt in Europe. So this just again gives you a little bit more information there. So um, we are concerned about this. So a lot of times people say, well, why are you concerned about negative interest rates? And let me give you a couple of reasons why negative interest rates should be of interest to you and also concern you. First, when you have negative interest rates, it's not a sign of economic health. It's an alarming symptom of profound economic dysfunction. Function. It means that wealth is worth more today than in the future. It turns really the created order of time and value on its head. It means that over time, value is being eroded, not increased in value, or you're not creating value over time. And this is, is uh, ridiculous. It's insanity when it comes to an economic system. But it is there to support a debt ridden system on its last legs. Second, no country has ever devalued itself to prosperity. In fact, over time, the reverse is always true. Countries that engage in devaluation of their currency and their money and increasing, increasing levels of debt will eventually pay the piper and pay the cost. It never works out well over time. Third, negative rates disadvantage particular groups in the economy. And these are very important groups. In fact, I would argue that some of the most important groups, savers, investors, pensioners, retirees, insurance companies, companies where there are pools of savings are disadvantaged because they cannot make economic returns. In fact, on the flip side, you reward debtors. And who's the biggest debtor? Governments. And so governments use negative interest rates to grow their own indebtedness, to extend their reach into the economy, to expand regulations, to expand their size. And uh, as we know, as government grows, the private sector gets squashed, economic growth goes down, individual freedom is curtailed, and we get into a serious, serious dependency on the state. And so, uh, as negative interest rates continue, the state gets larger, there is increased dependence on the state uh, uh, from more and more of the people. Fourth, it encourages risky behavior. Investors who wouldn't normally go into risky investments are really forced or certainly encouraged to go into riskier investments from bonds into the equity market because they're looking for returns. And so uh, a lot of investors uh, overstep their risk parameters and this is not good over time because eventually markets come down and they'll lose a lot of money. Six has led to, um, I should say fifth, an undermining of our currency and uh, when you lower rates you undermine your currency. We don't really have money anymore. There's no store of value and um, that's very harmful again to savers and individuals who look to the money as a medium of exchange in any kind of store of value. Six, we have encouraged a bond bubble and high, high real estate market. And uh, a high, high real estate market means that people are taking on too much debt, personal debt. It means that the banks are vulnerable to mortgage problems in the economy. And so our financial system is increasingly at risk as the value of real estate goes up and people's indebtedness to buy that real estate also goes up with it. So those are just some of the concerns that we have. What are we doing to uh, deal with some of those concerns? As we've talked about before, we keep some cash around. We're gonna dollar cost average into great companies which are getting uh, really plastered in the market currently right now. So it gives us great opportunities to, to invest at lower prices. We continue to buy quality, quality assets, businesses with great balance sheets. Uh, limited amount of debt and counterparty risk. Watch our financials. Make sure we're not overweight in the financials. Make sure we have hard assets, physical assets that are real, that are tangible, that the government cannot print. And then lastly, as we've talked to you many, many times, keep a 
a decent weighting, a healthy weighting in the precious metal sector. Uh, so far this year, the best performing asset um, in the marketplace really have been the silver and gold sector. And so this acts as a hedge and protection against the downward draft in some of the other areas of the market. So in a nutshell, um, we are doing well and we're hanging in uh, quite well versus the marketplace, which uh, is to be expected given our quality of assets, given our cash holdings, given our precious metals holdings. But all of these negative interest rates, all of the debt that we see around the world, the concerns in China and so forth, uh, we need to be careful. We need to be vigilant and we need to be protecting our wealth in the midst of um, a very dysfunctional monetary system. Now, if you have any questions, please let us know. Uh, email, uh, stop by the office. And again, we'll continue to be vigilant in protecting your capital in the portfolios. Thank you very much for, for, uh, for listening. Bye now.